So we are continuing our series on the road again, and we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. I had so much material, I had to cut it in half, like on the spot, because I was like, there's no way I'm getting through another sermon after I've already preached one. One's enough, all right? And so we're going to pick it up. What I'm going to do for just a few minutes is do a quick recap of last week, very, very brief. If you want all the details, you can listen to it. It's online everywhere. Um, But just to let us know, so we're at the point in Paul's ministries, we've been going through Acts now since January of last year. We're nearing the finish line here. We'll be done by the end of the year. We have reached the end of Paul's third missionary journey. He's come back to Jerusalem, sort of the, the epicenter of the first century church. And he's been told on his way, he's actually been warned, and they plead with him, don't go, because when you go there, it's going to be bad. You're you're going to be imprisoned, and it's not going to be very nice. But he is resolute. He's going to go. And so let's read where we started last week to give us the context here. Acts 21 is where we are. Acts 21, verse 17, when Paul enters Jerusalem here, it says this. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church. I read that wrong every time. All the elders of the Jerusalem church were present there. I read it right that time, okay? After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God. And then they said, you know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the laws of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or to follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. And so last week we started a discussion on the dangers of legalism. So the problem that Paul finds himself, and as we'll continue to see, continues to find himself in here in Acts 21 is because of legalism. Now, it's not because he's legalistic. It's because the other Jewish believers in Jerusalem are legalistic. So they're saying that Paul is saying what he's not saying. You hear what I'm saying? (laughs) Is that clear enough? All right. So legalism is a problem then and even now. And so we discuss, we started this idea of the dangers of legalism. So we'll look at the first two very quickly that we looked at last week and then launch off into number three here in just a moment. So the number one danger of legalism is legalism distorts. Again, Paul is in trouble here because they are distorting his message. The, the people there are saying, well, Paul teaches that if you're a, a Jew who becomes, a, or if you're even a Jew who's even not a Christian, but you live among Gentiles, Paul's saying don't worship the law. Try to fit in with the culture, right, the, with the Gentile culture around you. Paul has never said that. He would never say that, right? Even the Jewish Christians, they're claiming, he's saying don't follow the law. Well, he, he's saying you can if you want. But understand that the law never did and never will save you. It's faith in Jesus that saves you. So what Paul would say, honestly, is if you want to still obey the laws of Moses with your belief in Jesus, have at it. Just know the law is not what saved you or what keeps you saved or anything. It's faith alone in Jesus. So they're distorting his words. And Paul was very clear on this. So when he was in Jerusalem years ago, they thought they had settled this matter. Look really quickly at at verse 25 of Acts 21. Um, This is what the leaders are saying to Paul. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So there are certain moral standards that Paul would still say yes, right? We don't just – it's not a free-for-all. We'll get to that later today even. But he is saying that the the legalities is not what saves a person. It's faith in Christ who fulfilled the law that saves a person. But they have distorted his words. They've distorted what he said. And legalism, as we discussed last week, is kind of ugly because it doesn't just distort belief systems or thought patterns. It begins to distort you. The more legalist you become, it distorts you. It twists your way of seeing other people. You believe things that aren't really true. You, you hear a second or third hand story about someone and immediately start to judge them, even though you have no evidence that it's even true or accurate at all. But legalism does that. It changes our hearts. It hardens our hearts. It darkens our hearts. And it operates under the guise of righteousness. But again, it, it gets pretty nasty. And here we see in Acts 21, a mob breaks out in the temple. The legalists are so disagreeing with Paul being in the temple that they start a riot and it because of their distortion of what Paul had said. We'll come back to that here in just a second. The second danger that we looked at last week of legalism is that legalism demands. The, 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 I'll repeat the statement I said last week. 
legalism demands more of you than God does. That's the crazy part about legalism. His legalism is God has a standard. He has rules. He has a way he wants us to live. But legalism puts a fence around that and a fence around that. It makes rules about the rules about the rules. And the rules about the rules about the rules become the rules everyone should follow. And that's just not how it is. Uh, Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. He says, clearly, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, good works are, are good, right? It's in the name, good works. But they, good works do not save anyone. Doing religious tradition doesn't save anyone. Following church, you know, law doesn't save anyone. Just reading your Bible can lead you to salvation through Christ, but just reading the words on the page is not going to get you in. It's faith in Christ alone. But legalism demands more of us than what is actually required by God. And what we talked about last week a little bit was that gets into this realm of hypocrisy, where I begin to demand more of others than even sometimes I do of myself. That's a big danger of this. Um, legalism is all about show. It's all about appearances. It's about performance. And it claims, you know, a legalist would say, well, no, it's me trying to be holy. In reality, legalism is I want everyone to see how holy I'm trying to be. And that, again, gets really, really nasty because it's, it's about look at me or it's about I'm more holy than this person or I have all these rules I follow and they don't, so I'm better than them. Legalism gets to a very dark, very unhealthy place if we're not careful. So those are the first two dangers of legalism. Again, it, there's a lot more to say about that. We mentioned it last week. You can look it up. But first, d- uh, legalism distorts and legalism demands. What we'll do today with the rest of our time is we'll look at the third danger of legalism, and then I want to offer us a better way to live. Legalism has these issues, these problems, these dangers, but there's a better, I think, more accurate way to live, and we'll look at that today, too. So here's the third danger of legalism that we'll cover for just a few minutes, and that is legalism divides. Legalism divides. So first it distorts and it demands, and now it divides. So a mob literally breaks out in the temple in Jerusalem because what's happened is the day before, earlier in the day, these legalists saw Paul in the town square, not in the temple, in the town square with a non-Jew, with a Gentile. And then they see Paul later that day in the temple, and they assume that this non-Jew is with him in the temple, and the riot breaks out, which wasn't the case at all. He did not bring this person in. He didn't defile the temple. He's not talking bad against the law of God. But they, these assumptions cause this division, so much so that the Roman authorities have to get involved. It's gotten out of control because just like in this is maybe, you know, 30 years after Jesus, the same rules apply where if a certain group of people in town get out of hand, the Roman authorities have to intervene. That's just what they're going to do. And so let's look at what what happens here. Let's continue on Acts 21. We're going to skip down to verse 33. So this mob is breaking out. It's getting chaotic and crazy. And here's what happens. Verse 33. Then the commander arrested Paul and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind shouting, kill him, kill him. So here in Acts 21, legalism has literally resulted in chaos in a mob, in a riot. Everyone's shouting, there's confusion. Even when the guards try to calm them down and get a straight story, they're divided on what's happened. Well, we know he did something we don't like, but we're not quite sure. We can't quite agree on what that thing was. It's so chaotic and divided, they can't figure it out among themselves. They are that divided. And they're in such a frenzy, as we just read, the Roman soldiers have to lift this guy on their shoulders And protect him from the mob. That's how crazy and divided they are. A danger of legalism is it causes division. It causes confusion and chaos. And for the church, this is especially dangerous. And Paul warns about this, again, in his letter to the Galatian church. This is the first letter that Paul wrote. This was a big issue that he's confronting is these Judaizers who are saying it's not just faith in Jesus that saves you, but it's that plus obeying the law. And so he's writing to combat this false teaching. So let's look at Galatians 4, 17 and 18. He's warning the church here not to fall into this trap of legalism. He says this, those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. 
if someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right, but let them do it at the t- all the time, not just when I'm with you. So look at what Paul is accusing the Judaizers of doing here in the Galatian letter here. Their behavior sounds a lot like an abusive boyfriend or a, a manipulative you know, spouse, right? Because he says they're, the first thing they're going to do is shut you off from everybody else. That's like classic manipulative behavior. I'm going to shut you off from your family. I'm going to isolate you so that now I'm in control. I'm your only source. This is abusive, manipulative behavior that Paul is saying. These guys know they're wrong. They know that if they're, if they're going to really argue with me, they're going to lose. If, they, if you think about it too hard, you're going to side with me on this. And so they're trying to keep you from me so they have the power, they have the control. Legalism is about power and control. It's about I'm right, I'm going to convince you that I'm right, I'm going to beat it into your brain that I'm right about all these extra rules and make you feel bad that you're not following them or make me feel good that I am following them. And so that's one of the things that he's even seeing here in the first century. Or, you know, it's even like, you know, if you don't give, it's manipulative, if you don't give in to my demands and you don't really love me, that's what legalists do. If you don't follow these extra rules that I think are rules, then you don't really love God as much as I do. It's it's manipulation game. It's 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 a mind bending, right? It, it twists reality. And if you're faced with someone like that, it's really I know this word's overused anymore, but it is gaslighting. You feel like you're the one going crazy. What I mean, is that like do I have to wear a dress all the time? Like, is that in the Bible? Maybe it is in the Bible. It sounds like it's in the Bible. Like, do I have to have long hair and all this stuff? All it's, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, but is it? And so w- we begin to question everything we believe because of these uh, legalistic types of ways. It's very sneaky. It parades as holiness, but really, it's as we said, it's performative, and it beats people down. It judges other people, and it eventually it comes out. Again, if you're confronted with the reality of the grace of God and the mercy of Jesus and his love and forgiveness for you, and then you're confronted with all these rules and regulations, you're probably going to choose the former over the latter. And so we have to see that legalism makes that division. Another thing that it, that it does, especially for churches, it, is it causes division because legalism in churches will cause conversations to go from us and we to us versus them a big problem with legalism that even Paul here, let's look again at Galatians chapter 5. He warns of this very early on. Galatians 5 verse 13. Paul says, for you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law, so he's talking about the law here. What's he say? It can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So in Acts 21, legalism literally led to a mob. But in a faith community setting, in a church family setting, it leads spiritually to mobs. And it's the only inevitable outcome of legalism. Because here's the problem, here's the A problem with legalism, is how much legalism is enough? How do I know I'm following enough rules? Whose standard is the one I should follow? Is it 100 rules? Is it 103 rules? Is it this person's legalistic standard, or is it this person's even bigger legalistic standard? Where does it end? Where's the limit? And that's how it, it ca- it's a sliding scale, right? That's the problem. There's not an objective. There is an objective way, and it's actually in the scriptures, but legalism makes it a sliding scale. And so that's what causes division in, in so many cases. Um, it also does this. It, it, it even subdivides divisions in some ways. Because think about how ridiculous this is. So you've got a, a group of legalists over here, and they have these, let's say, these six specific rules. They're, they're I- extra to the Bible, but we believe that this is how you really are a faithful person. But then you've got another group of legalists over here, and they've got seven rules, you know. <laughs> so you've got, th- they agree on these, but they're still divided because of legalism. Because there's extra things here, and, well, we agree with three of those, but not the other three, so we're going to have our own group over here. And we just subdivide, 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 and splinter and shatter. Instead of, as, as Paul says, love each other, serve each other, be united, we become divided and subdivided and subdivided. Let me look at this other idea here as well, though. He, at the beginning of, of Galatians 5, 13 and 14, this idea that of what I'm going to call reverse legalism. Okay? So some people are, again— w- no one, we don't want anyone to be legalistic, okay? It's not healthy. 
But there are some who err way too far, and we'll get to that more in a minute too, on I'm just going to throw all the rules off. I'm going to live really free, you know. I'm going to do my thing and pray that Jesus' grace gets, you know, some like me, you know. And then what happens is the person on that end of the spectrum can look at someone who is trying to just do what God says and look at them as weird. It's reverse legalism. Someone who thinks of fewer rules judges those who abide. And there, again, it might be someone, like I might have personal convictions about things that Scripture isn't black and white on, and I'm just like, that's just for me. I'm not going to impose that on anybody else. I just choose to live that way. Um, and people might look at someone like that and say, well, they're, that's, they're just a weirdo. Stay away from them. They're just too buttoned up. They're trying to show up, even if they're not, even if it's a pure intention on that person's part, this reverse legalism sort of gets in the way. Needless to say, legalism is a mess, isn't it? It divides, it subdivides, it's confusing, it's chaotic, it's a mob, literally in Acts 21 and figuratively in our everyday lives. It's just a mess. So here's what I want to offer for a few minutes here is a better way. There's a better way than the division of legalism, than the judgmental nature of legalism, than the confusing, chaotic way of legalism. There is a better way. And it comes through really two simple words that we will explore together with a few scriptures for a few minutes. A better way is this, that we evaluate and encourage. A better way to avoid legalism but still live God's way is a better way to evaluate and encourage. What I want to do is kind of run through several um, portions of Paul's writings here for a few minutes and look at what he just says. How do we live this out? What does that actually mean to live this better way to evaluate and encourage? So we'll kind of go through one by one. We'll stop and discuss and point out some things he's mentioning here um, as we look at this better way to live to avoid legalism. All right. So let's look here at first at Philippians chapter three. Um, Philippians is a great chapter. Paul writes it while he's in jail. But it's a very it's the, the key theme of this prison epistle is joy which is wild to think about. He's in prison uh, for the gospel, and yet he's writing to the Philippian church about having joy and living the way of Christ. And so we'll, we'll read a few of these scriptures. We'll read this one first, Philippians 3, verse 12. Paul says this, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I'm already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So w- the first thing we can do to avoid legalism and walk in a better way is to admit we're not perfect. Now, that may even seem like, oh, Stephen, nobody does that. Legalists do that. That's the problem of legalism. Even if you don't intend to purport that you are perfect, that's the vibe that you give off if you're a legalist because your rules matter. They have to do things your way. They have to see things your way. They have to live life your way. And so you promote this idea of, if not perfection, at least superiority. But Paul says, no, no, a better way is to say, I've not reached that. And if anybody, I mean, Paul was not perfect, clearly, but Jesus is the only perfect person who ever lived. But if there's like a second place after his conversion, it's probably going to be Paul. He's going to be one of those guys where, like, really, are you sinning? Like, all you do is write letters and preach sermons. Like, I don't know, really know you got a lot of time to sin, Paul. But he's like, no, I've not reached perfection. I'm striving I'm trying to get closer to to Jesus. I'm trying to get closer to what he wants for me, but I've not reached that yet. That's a great, I'd say, easy starting point for all of us to avoid this trap, these dangers of legalism. It's to just say off the bat, I'm not claiming perfection. I'm not saying I'm going to get there. I'm just striving to get better each and every day. Easy thing to start with, okay? Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and see what else Paul says about a better way. Romans 12, verse 3. Paul says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. This kind of goes one step further. So first we acknowledge, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not claiming to be perfect. I'm avoiding that hypocrisy, that legalism. But then another step is I'm not trying to be more or pretend I'm more than I really am which is sometimes hard to do because sometimes we want to put up a front, you know, especially at church. We want to put up this front like everything's great and I'm doing great and I've got no problems, no struggles, no sin, no issues. Right. And it's just if we can just let that guard down, that's a better way to live. Now, that's risky. That's scary. There's vulnerability there to to admit that at times. 
uh, which is, again, a great plug for small groups. That's an easy way to let your guard down. It's not like I have to announce to the whole church on Sunday, I'm struggling with this sin. Would you pray for me? It can be in a smaller, more intimate setting with people that you know in a deeper relational way. And so there's another plug for that ministry starting in a couple of weeks. But when it comes to legalism, acknowledging, first of all, that I'm, I'm trying to evaluate myself correctly. I'm not trying to say I'm better than anyone else. Even if on secondary issues we disagree, uh, this is another phrase that's overused, but we can agree to disagree on certain things, even when it comes to faith, okay? There are certain second, there are primary issues that I will fight anyone over, okay? Like the sinless life of Jesus, the, the atoning death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Like there are things that I'm going to, I, I will not budge on. But there are other things about how, how we, you know, what kind of songs we sing at church, you know, that's, that's fine. We can, we can agree to disagree. Uh, different styles, different things like that. There are a lot of things that we can agree to disagree on, and that's a better way to live than getting in a riot over these things. Uh, we can discuss these disagreements in a great way. And I like the, the last thing he said here in, in verse 3 of Romans 12. He says, measure yourself by the faith God has given us. This is a great way to keep ourselves from getting legalistic is to realize not everyone around me is on the same spiritual level. So what may appear to be legalism might just be they have learned along the way I need to avoid <laughs> this thing. It's not good for me if I enter into this activity that may not be prohibited by Scripture, but for me it's going to cause me to stumble, right? So I've got to avoid that. So you may think, well, they're legalistic. No, no, no. They might just be on a different, in a different part of their life, a different area of their spiritual growth and development than you are, and so that's okay. We're all on a journey. We're not always on the same point of that journey. And so understanding that will help us to give people the benefit of the doubt more often on either side of this issue. Whether we think, well, man, they really just don't have their act together. They just became a Christian like three weeks ago. Give them a break. You know, they're not going to be where you are when you've been a Christian for 30 years. So, but we don't always, we think, oh, it's all cookie cutter or we're all on the same exact point, on the same exact journey. But Paul says, measure yourself by the faith God has given us. So where I, a, am I where I want to be, where I need to be on my journey? And if not, God help me to get over those things, work through those things, overcome those things to get there, and then help me to come alongside somebody else to help them get along on their journey too. Measure ourselves by where we are on our faith journey. We're going to go back to Philippians. We're kind of going all over the place a little bit here. Um, Philippians chapter 2, one more time, verses 2 and 3. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Philippians 2. You should read it sometime this week. It, it's really I incredible. But Philippians 2, verse 2, Paul says this, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. This is a similar idea to what we just discussed, but it's, it comes down to I'm not going to try to pretend to be what I'm not. I'm not going to put up this guard or this front. I'm not going to pretend to be better. I'm not, and also the other side of this too, I'm not going to abandon a personal conviction just because somebody else doesn't quite understand that. That's okay, too. It's okay to say, I'm not saying you have to live this way. I'm saying this is how I'm choosing to live. My, my faith in Jesus is essential, but to keep me on that path, I need to avoid these certain areas, okay? And it's okay to do that. But along the way, he says, be humble. That's an important thing for us to all remember to do. Be teachable. Be aware of those around us as we're living this life of faith and growing in our life of faith. These are, this is a better way than this judgmental, legalistic, stiff, rules-based way of life. It's, it's just a much better way to live. Later on, let's skip down in Philippians 2, still again here. He goes on to say this in verse 12. Philippians 2, verse 12. It's the other side of this legalism coin here for just a minute. He says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. Now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Then he says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So, in the last week and a half now, some of you have maybe a little bit concerned with the material. You're like, he's talking about not obeying the rules. Does he really believe in any rules? Like maybe you're concerned here that we're not, we're going too far in one direction. So I, I want to make sure that we understand where we're trying to get here. It's not an either or. It's like we're trying to walk this tightrope. 
okay? And so all this talk about legalism, holiness is a thing. God does have expectations of his people. The church it does, does have parameters that we are to abide by, so we can get too far. We, we want to avoid legalism, yes, but sometimes in an effort to avoid that, we just throw everything out, no rules. And so that's not the solution here. Paul shows us here that we can find a balance. And really what he says is that your good works do not make you, uh, do not bring salvation, but they are evidence of your salvation. So you put faith in Jesus, you put your faith in him to cleanse you of your sins. Guess what? You're a new creature. You're, you're right with God. You're, you're made righteous. And then from then on out, then your life should reflect that change in your life. Not that I'm trying to earn favor with God or earn his love or forgiveness. You can't do that anyway. It's not earnable. It's a gift that he gives. We already said that. And so your faith in Jesus should be obvious and noticeable without being legalistic. And that's a tightrope walk, but let's look at it. So if someone can't sense any difference in you before your conversion and after, you may have erred too much on the side of no rules, right? If there's no noticeable difference between how you lived before you became a Christian and how you are now, then maybe you didn't become a Christian, right? Like maybe you really need to con like convert, right? That's a possibility. Or maybe it's just that maybe we need to really look at what the Bible does say about what the parameters are and follow those and stick to those, right? If someone can't tell a difference between your life and someone else totally apart from Christ, that's, that's a problem. Now, what that doesn't mean, again, the legalist in me be like, well, I have to avoid anyone who's not a Christian then, right? Or I'm, I can't be seen with them. Like, you know, that was Paul's issue here in Acts 21. He was seen with a non-Jew, and then they thought he was still with him in this holy place, right? But, so, but who's Jesus around all the time? He's around sinners all the time. He's ministering to people that need him all the time. And so in an effort, you know, in an effort to remain pure, a legalist will then sometimes cut themselves off from any interaction with anybody who's not a believer. And that's not helpful for the world at large. We need to rub shoulders, and you do at your job. You do in your neighborhood. You rub shoulders with people who are not believers in Jesus. That's good. Rub shoulders with them. Be friends with them. Have them over for dinner, right? Do things with them. Have a relationship with them. That's good. Now, we're again, we we're not trying to be like them to the point to where there's no discernible difference in how we live life. But there is that, again, tightrope walk here of a better way to live. Here's another thing uh, on this better way. If your faith isn't growing or stretching you, that's also not a good sign. So if you are so, sometimes we get comfortable, like I've got this figured out now. I kind of know the things to do. I know the routine. I got, but you're, you're never stretched. Then maybe we need to see what, what more God might have for us and never settle in where we are. We want to have these desires to please God in a healthy, non-legalistic way. Because as we kind of mentioned, there are two sides that are unhealthy. There's the one side where it's rules, rules, rules. I got to do all the things right all the time. And I got to expect everybody else to do all the rules all the time. And then to, to kind of balance out, we go too far over here. And there's no rules, no expectations. I can do whatever I want. But it's like, no, no, there's a balance here. There's a middle that we can help to find. And what I love here is, is what Paul says in Philippians 2. He says, um, oh, work Work hard to show the result of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So if that's my mindset, if I wake up every day saying, God, what can I do to please you today? That's going to be a better way to live than I got to follow these, this checklist. Like, okay, God, lead me in how you want me to live rather than I've got this all, this figured out checklist. I just got to do all the things, check the boxes, follow the rules, the do's and don'ts, be a good boy, good girl to earn God's favor and love. No, but if I focus on the Holy Spirit working in me, giving me a growing desire to love God and serve him, that's a better way to live. It's a better, a better way to stay on balance, to be an effective light in a dark world. The goal then is to be different enough to be noticed as a follower of Jesus, uh, but to be loving enough to not attack those who have not followed Jesus yet. We want to attract and not attack. One more scripture, and then we'll, we'll close today, and it's Hebrews 10, 24. This is the encouragement that we can have as we live a better way. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Not guilt trip people over your standard, <laughs> right? Uh, not beat people down until they do things your way. Not to think less of someone who doesn't meet your legalistic standard. But he says, no, motivate one another. Encourage one another. Partner with 
one another, uplift each other. That's what the beauty of the body of Christ is. That's who we're designed to be. That although we may have certain differences on secondary issues, we can come together united, not a divided mob in the street causing problems, but a united front making a real difference in the world around us. That's who we're called to be. We can motivate each other through these acts of love and good works. It's not that we go one way or the other too far. We're on the same team with the same goals, same purpose in mind, pushing each other in these healthy, productive ways. So again, going back to last week, don't believe the distortion of legalism, but just know clearly what God has said and go with that. Let go of the demands of legalism. It's too heavy. It's too weighty. It's not how you're designed to live. Don't allow the division uh, of legalism to divide you, your family, your friends, the church, anything. But let's choose this better way, finding freedom in Jesus, finding peace and joy in loving and serving Jesus as a united body doing this thing for Jesus together. Let's pray today. God, we are, if we follow you, we, we desire to love you. We desire to serve you. If we are followers of Jesus, we desire to show evidence of our faith. And so, Holy Spirit, help us to not get bogged down with the do's and the don'ts and the particulars and, and become legalistic. We don't want that kind of life. There's a better way. Or we can know, okay, God does have these expectations. God does want a life of holiness um, to, to him. But he wants me to do it in a way that gives grace to others, in a way that lives joyful, in a way that promotes peace in those around me. That's a better way to live. Help us to not give in to the demands of legalism that weigh us down, that take the joy from serving you. Help us not be divided um, as a community of faith by legalism that it's got to be this specific way or it's got to be my way or it's got to be this preference or that belief or that tradition or that style. Help us to keep secondary issues where they belong and help us to keep the primary issues at the top where they belong so we can be united as a faith family. Help us to avoid the dangers of legalism and to choose a better way by your spirit and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.